Hey, I'm Joe Connolly with quite a business growth story to tell you about today. I'm here with Jennifer Wilson Buttigieg of Valerie Wilson Travel, which started as a one woman business with Jennifer's mom that, with the help of the daughters and the family, grew to become an internationally recognized brand. And I love this. Valerie Wilson Travel is described as a perfect blend of a big agency with a lot of buying power with the attention to detail of a boutique agency. And that attention to detail is what separates so many smaller businesses. Jennifer, I read that your business recently merged with Frosh Travel, another family-owned business, by the way, as a way to save Valerie Wilson's employees' benefits and jobs. Is that is that correct? Joe, it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and thank you. As a second-generation family business owner, nothing's more important than your business family. And the global pandemic, which none of us could possibly have imagined, basically turned the water spout off of travel. And business was down up to 95%. And as a leader and as a person and as a family, what we wanted to do was not only save the brand, but save our people. And we uh, had the opportunity to be acquired by Frosh Travel in May of 2021. And it was the bringing together of two family brands, two second generation brands, two entrepreneurial parents, quite honestly, Richard Liebman on the Frosh side, and Brian Liebman, who's the CEO and president, and Valerie Wilson, who you mentioned is our founder and our chairman, and then obviously the second generation, which I'm part of. So we were so excited to bring these two powerhouse brands together, but with the goal of saving as many employees' jobs and benefits during this very challenging period, because we knew travel would eventually rebound and we're gonna need them. What happened? The revenues were down so much, like so many businesses, you had to uh, cut costs. And this was a way to do it. I talked to one of your employees and I said, is that so? And the employee said, yes, it is. That is what is happening. We're saving our jobs. So it sounds like they are thrilled. Well, we're very fortunate. We're in a customer service business. And at the end of the day, it's our people. And we have employees and colleagues that have been with us 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And um, during the pandemic or any crisis, you have to act with the facts that you have at that moment in time. And even though these were changing goalposts because, you know, first there was a quarantine and then it was a lockdown and then there were no planes that were flying, planes were grounded. Then certain cities like New York, people just didn't go into for months. So we had to constantly pivot, constantly shift direction, knowing what was most important to us as, as a family brand were our people. That's great. And I think I don't think a lot of people realize, especially with family businesses, but with many small businesses, how dedicated, committed, even loving often they are of uh, their employees. Now, what have you been doing to help your clients with the cancellations and delays? Oh my, that's a whole topic unto itself. I, I actually probably would back up a second and say the role of the travel advisor has never been so important. Um, I not only have my Valerie Wilson travel hat as co-president and very proudly a member of the executive team with Frosh, but I am co-chair of government affairs for ASTA, the American Society of Travel Advisors. And the role of the advisor is more critical than ever. A, there's so much information out there. We have to help our clients and travelers understand what the needs were during the pandemic. Did you need a PCR test? Did you need a rapid test? Did you need to be tested before you come back into this country? And we were part of that movement and we're so proud that the government uh, removed the inbound testing because that is not only going to help the U.S. economy, it's going to help travel and tourism come back. So have you been quickly making adjustments to clients' plans because of the early summer problems with the schedules? We have uh, been making adjustments to client plans always. 
I would say early in the pandemic, getting them out during the pandemic, sharing with them what their tolerance for travel was, i.e. closer to home when hotels became the single largest travel type to um, traveling, traveling on a road trip to if you have uh, the excitement and adventurous spirit to actually get your passport and leave the country. So to your specific point of cancellations and delays, yes, that's what a travel advisor does. They are there to service your customer day in, day out, not just booking something extraordinary like a safari or going back to Europe with all this pent up demand, but someone traveling to the West Coast or Canada where their flight may have been canceled. Do you have somebody on call 24 hours or anything like that? Um, in this wonderful world of technology, uh, it depends on what type of customer you are. Obviously, our corporate clients and that business, um, if, if you were an essential service, they traveled throughout the pandemic. If you are more of an SME, you're figuring out your travel policies and people are starting to get back on the road. SME meaning SME? Uh, small, medium enterprise business. Okay. So um, small, yep. smaller organizations that really make up a lot of what travel is. And they were the first ones to get back out on the road because they wanted to see their customer. They wanted to look them in the eye, shake their hand, thank them for their business, quite honestly. So do we have someone 24 seven? We have lots of different types of colleagues. We, we have employees um, that work on different accounts or different businesses like leisure, corporate, cruises, safaris, different specialists, as we call them. And then we have independent contractors who run their own business under our umbrella. And as an independent contractor, they certainly could work 24-7. But we do also uh, utilize a 24-7 service. This is interesting. And I just have one other a question, uh, since this is a, a, a primarily a business program, before Neil asks some questions. What basically I've wondered is the business model? Do clients pay the travel advisor a fee or do the service providers pay or is it a combination? How does it work? And I would say it's one that's in constant flux. Um, my mom started the business 41 years ago and I joined 32. And I have seen every end of the spectrum during that time. And what I would say, the role of the advisor, we do charge a service fee. No differently than an accountant, a lawyer, a nutritionist, a trainer or a professional being your advocate. So we do charge a planning fee, a service fee, a ticketing fee, again, depending if it's leisure, um, vacation or corporate. In terms of compensation from suppliers, there are still commissions in the marketplace, uh, but that is like paying for shelf space at a grocery store. There's usually a preferencing um, and a partnership that goes there. What I think everybody has realized, not only through multiple crises like 9-11, uh, economic uh, challenges of 2007-08, um, Ash Cloud, Murazika, but particularly with the pandemic is as a traveler, you need an advocate and your travel advisor is that advocate. And knowing that time is the most precious commodity, whether you travel for business or vacation, you want it to be the experience you're planning. And no differently than having a professional help you on a will or sell a home or do your taxes, the role of the advisor has been elevated. And I'm incredibly proud to be a part of this industry. I'm glad you're still here. Neil. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, uh, New York City's economy is very dependent on tourism, especially in the summer and the holidays. What are you seeing right now in terms of international travel to New York? What I would say is it's starting to rebound. I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, I, I went in quite regularly. I would see Grand Central Station where it was like a movie set or Times Square where there was nobody there. And it's nice to see the sidewalks a little busier. It's nice to see restaurants a little fuller. I think we are, are definitely shifting from pandemic to endemic. And knowing that there is no inbound testing requirement, which was huge for ASTA, and CLIA, which is the Cruise Association, and A4A, the airlines, and USTOA, all of these different trade associations rely on tourism, not just outbound tourism, but inbound tourism. And, and having that uh, inbound testing requirement lifted was huge. So hotels are hopefully going to start to see more business in cities because rural 
areas, beaches, mountains thrive during the last two years, but it's the cities, to your point, Neil, that have really, really hurt. Yeah. And so what is the feedback that you're getting from business travelers? Are they telling you that they're ready to get back in the air? They're ready to travel again for work? Or a lot of what we saw early on and even through two years is that uh, they were okay with doing virtual for international. What are you hearing right now? I'm hearing a little bit of everything. And we actually had a corporate advisory um, council meeting for Frost with our top customers in Boston last week. And it was great to get our clients back where we could see them face to face. And it really came down to almost two paths. One, the diehard road warrior who just kept traveling and can't wait to get back. And then the other that may be hesitant because the family has a compromised immune system or elder care parents, or they realize their time and value was spent in a different way. So there's no right answer, but I'm gonna, gonna bring up three themes. One, leisure. If people are traveling now, they may go on business and they may extend for leisure. The differentiation between corporate travel and vacation travel, this leisure theme is definitely coming back. That's one. Two, I think there will continue to be a hybrid where there are Zoom calls like we're doing right now instead of me being in your studio. Um, but the face-to-face -face is still important. And that face-to-face -face is my third point where we've seen companies wanna have culture and community and focus on their core values. And they're doing it with offsite meetings. They're doing it with retreats. Not everyone's comfortable to go back into big offices in the major cities yet. That will come over time, but right now, companies are making sure that their employees, just like we did with Valerie Wilson Travel and Frosh, are most important in getting them together offsite. Just to wrap up, it's unusual that a lot of family businesses make it to the second or even third generation. Uh, what's it like and what advice do you have for other family business families? <laughs> um, family businesses are amazing. Look at it as three concentric circles. You have the family, you have the family business, and you have the business, and then you have the center core. And at the center core, it's your core values, which sounds hokey, but it's your people. And we're in the business of serving, and we love the travel industry. So um, I'm a huge supporter of new businesses, entrepreneurship, family businesses. The best advice I would give is with my sister, Kimberly Wilson Weddy, who's my co-president, is that we try to text each other as sisters and we email each other as colleagues. You need to set some boundaries. Sometimes boundaries are protective and a good thing. Jennifer, you're a great speaker. You're a great spokeswoman for your industry. We've really enjoyed talking with you. Keep Joe, moving. Neil, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor, as you can see. I love this industry and I am so excited to see it come back and continue to thrive. Always happy to be a resource for you. Thank you.